Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. What a blessing is right, John, to, to remember back when the Lord has touched us. When the Lord has touched you, you're never the same. Once you taste him of the Lord and you know that he's good, there's, there's no going back. Love you, Brother John, and I do. I love your heart. Sensitive. Sensitive to God. And, uh, you know. <clears throat> this morning, I chose uh, this message of uh, strengthening and encouraging the church to remain true to the faith. Because in the times we're in, in the times when this was written, there was many tribulation, many persecution, and many trials uh, that were transpired. I've taken this from the book of Acts, and we know that that's the Acts of the Apostle, chapter 14, and it's taken from Paul's first missionary journey. And if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, you'll know that he went from town to town, city to city, proclamating the gospel, and yet warning those who heard the gospel to remain true to the faith. Because there were many that took heed to the message, but as we see them later in Scripture, they have departed. Demas, for he loved this world, went back to his way. There was a couple of men and we'll look at the passage of scripture coming up, uh, that shipwrecked their faith. There's something about keeping our faith strengthened and encouraged it. Jesus forewarned there'll be times of tribulation. Personally, I think that we don't speak on this topic more because I believe that we want to get not only disciples, but we want converts. And if we would warn converts that there's trouble ahead, when you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not going to be smooth sailing. It's not going to be out in a lounge chair on a sunlit beach having a margarita. <laughs> there's not alcoholic. <laughs> there's going to be great trouble and great persecution. <coughs> So the more and more I looked into that, every time Paul would leave a city, or he would tell them, he says, have I not told you, you were destined to this. And we're going to look through the passage of Scripture. Instead of me just reciting it, I'm going to give you the passages of Scripture, and we're going to look at that together. So we're going to look at Paul's first missionary journey here. Uh, him and Barnabas were sent out from Antioch, uh, probably around A.D. 44, it was a two-year journey, approximately, and they made it through some, uh, some towns there. They went into uh, modern-day Turkey, uh, where you, you may see the church of Galatia and that area there, uh, Tess, Sidon, Iconium, uh, all these places where the gospel was proclamated. And so we're just going to pick up on a couple of verses, chapter 14, uh, by the way, what leads up to these couple of verses that I'm going to read, Paul has already just been stoned and left for dead. They stoned him, they thought he was a god, and they, they, they thought that they uh, had killed him, but later he rose up and went out of the city and then came back uh, sometime later right in the same city to proclamate the gospel. And this is what he said. This is after he was stoned, by the way. Uh, they thought that uh, him and uh, uh, Barnabas were gods. <laughs> and so in verse uh, 21 it says, And when they had preached the gospel in that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, Listen to what he says. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. 
And so when they appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. May God add his blessing to his holy word. So, Father, we ask now, give us some insight to your word, Father. Help us to see, Lord, uh, the many trials that are before them and have been before us. And uh, we'll thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. You know, this gospel, when it is preached, uh, there's always opposition. Uh, there's opposition then, and there's opposition today. Uh, for the Jews in the synagogue, they didn't want to hear about a, a Messiah coming and dying on a cross. Uh, they had it up in their mind what God is and what God would be, and their, their uh, religion didn't want to be disturbed. Uh, there were people where Paul had preached this gospel, followed him 90 miles to this place to get him stoned. Could you imagine that? Hating his message so much that they followed him to stir up the, those around them to stone him. Look, look what the verses say back in, say, verse 19. It says, Then the Jews from Antioch, Iconium, came to Lystra. Right? This is, this is, uh, uh, I'm sorry. I want to go back to uh, chapter uh, uh, I lost the uh, so the, yeah so the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there having persuaded the multitudes this is verse 19 uh, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city supposing him to be dead they followed him from Antioch which was almost 90 miles away that's why I had to look at that. Could you imagine that? Hating the message of the gospel so much <clears throat> to go ahead to stop this thing. And maybe you and me, we would say, man, I'm done with this. But it was so important to Paul to proclamate this gospel. He knew when he met the risen Christ, there was nothing greater than this gospel. There is nothing better than proclamating this throughout Europe, it became after this, uh, to <coughs> proclamate this truth so that many would be saved. Because without the gospel, there is so, no salvation. So there, there was this uh, great uh, uprising. Look at the beginning of chapter 14. And it says this, Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and spoke to the great multitude, both of the Jews and the Greeks, believed. That sounds good, man. That, this sounds like they, they spoke so effectively that many were one to the kingdom of God. And that's awesome. And he, Paul would be rejoicing. Now look what happens in the next verse. Look what the next verse says. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brother. They spoke, did you hear what that just said? They spoke against this message and poisoned the minds and tried to say, no, don't be listening uh, to this message. Uh, this is not true. And so, uh, Many believed, and then many did not believe. And there was an opposition. Uh, and some, uh, somehow, in some ways, you could see that today. This gospel is not readily received uh, in the 21st century. Uh, you just go to your workplace, or you just go around family members, and uh, we kind of like skate around it and we don't, we don't want to say once you s surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, there's going to be a great opposition. Jesus said this, if they hate you, remember they hated me first. And anyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ will be persecuted. Anyone who leads a godly life 
and Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We find. Follow me over to go to 1 Timothy for a minute. And I want to uh, look at a passage of Scripture. 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1. We're going to be going to a number of places to what the Bible teaches us about this. Strengthening uh, is something that takes consistency. Do you know that? Strengthening is something that needs to be consistent. I have a friend of mine, he used to be a, a police officer in, in Pleasantville, and uh, I've known him 40 some years, and just this past few years, he came down with some weird ailment that attacked his nervous system, and he has to walk with a walker. He was this six foot two muscular guy. He's still this six foot two muscular guy. He's at the gym with his walk. He, he's continued the consistency. He can't do the, what he used to do, but he's consistent in working out because that's what it takes to remain strong. Now, you may say, well, is it a physical effort? We find in Scripture that the Bible says to be strong in the Lord and His mighty strength, right? To be strong in the Lord and His mighty strength. Those who hope in the Lord will what? Renew their strength, right? So when you have hope and you depend on the Lord, He's the one who strengthens us. So it wasn't the physical strength, but there is a consistency of us continue going back to the well and drinking. You see, because if you only drink once from the well, you're going to be thirsty again. Now, I'm not talking about salvation, nor was I talking about you must go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. You must go through many tribulations to walk in the kingdom of God. You, you don't get saved by going through the tribulations, but if you walk in the kingdom of God, you'll, you'll inherit tribulations. Because you're salt. Because you're light. And the world is darkness. So there's great opposition. Okay? And we don't like that. Christians are not. We don't like that. We just can't. We all just get along and say, Oh, by y'all. Right? Can't we? But here's what 1 Timothy, uh, Paul's warning Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Did I give you that? Chapter 1? Look at verse 18 and 19. He says this. To this charge I commit to you, Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage a good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected, concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. You see that? They shipwreck their faith. How do we shipwreck our faith? We throw off the yoke that Jesus wants us to walk with. Remember, he says, come to me, all you are heavy laden, you're weary, take my yoke upon you, take my yoke upon you, for I am gentle and humble at heart. I will give you rest for your soul. Learn from me. And when we throw the yoke of Jesus off, we're kind of shipwrecking in our faith. We're in a world today. You know, imagine a boat. Imagine that our, we're sailing to our destiny. Now, there are certain things in this life that we don't want in the boat. We, we don't want water in the boat. You get water in the boat, you destroy the boat. You want water under the boat. So under the boat is what lifts the boat, right? So we don't want to shipwreck our faith. So if you, you let the water in the boat, right, Luke? It's going to destroy, it's going to shipwreck you. Right? So there's certain guards, there are certain uh, guidelines that we should follow and one of those, and I, I will say three things, is this, is the Word of God, right? The second thing would be this, uh, would be prayer. And the third thing 
would be the encouragement of one another. You see? The Word of God is our guiding the ship. It is what we steer by. Right? We steer by the very Word of God. Remember I said last week, it's kind of like keeping that instrument with the stars when you're in the ship. You know, it's not that we're perfect, uh, but we guide by the Word of God. You know, so that we don't shipwreck. We pray as we commune with our Heavenly Father and then we encourage. You remember when we went back and looked at the scripture, what Paul had uh, written to those? He said, strengthening and encouraging the disciples to what? Remain true to the faith because we will go through many persecutions and many tribulations to enter into the kingdom of God. Have a place in if you get turning with your first Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. This is Paul on his latter journeys. You know, some say three missionary journeys, some say four, depending on when he was taking offerings to Jerusalem. Uh, but this was the purpose of Paul uh, starting churches, uh, encouraging them. And he was concerned for the churches that this might happen. And don't you think God's concerned for his church today? If you look at Revelation and you look at those seven churches that are mentioned in Revelation, there was issues with them. There was issues uh, after uh, a time of, you know, the, the greatest church we think in the New Testament was would have been the church from Ephesus. Uh, Jesus said this to him. He says, you, you have fallen away. You have lost what is it? Your first love. Your first love. And so <clears throat> that's why out the gate the Apostle Paul was not just giving this cotton candy gospel. He was telling them once you trust the Lord Jesus Christ persecution is going to come. You're going to have struggles. There's don't believe the health, wealth, and prosperity that may some would tell you. There's going to be trouble. Jesus forewarned us and told us also. And I guess I, you know, we resist from saying that because we want to, we want more people to come to this church. We wouldn't want to tell them that, man, there's going to be, but but what you save them, what you save them with is what you save them to. So if you save them with just this this smooth sailing life, and then the trouble comes, it's almost as if we didn't tell them the truth. And the Apostle Paul out front said, no, you know, friends, there's going to be great troubles. Now, the church at uh, Thessalonica in chapter 3, I'm going to just... Now, all through, every, every uh, book that we find in the New Testament, there's something there, even from Jesus, you know, his last days of the parables of, of uh, you know, the, uh, he spoke about all the warnings to be prepared, to be ready, and these are different uh, parables of uh, um, what the days ahead may, may look like, you know, if, uh, Matthew chapter 24 says something like this, it says, you know, uh, in the latter days when trouble and tribulation comes, it says that the, the, the faith of many is going to wax cold. Wow, that's a pretty stern warning, isn't it? You know, the love of many will lose uh, their temperatures. You know? So, 1 Thessalonians 3, Paul now writes to the church, uh, He's there in Corinth, and he's worried about the church there at Thessalonica, so he sends Timothy. Uh, by the way, um, where Paul was back and he got stern there in Lystra and in Derby, that's where Timothy was from. He didn't meet Timothy on that first missionary journey. It was on the, the next one. But anyway, he's sending Timothy here to Thessalonica to encourage them and worry about them that 
they may fail in their faith. Now listen to this. It says, <clears throat> chapter 3, verses 1 through uh, 5. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it would be good to be left in Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning the faith. Now, if I stop right there, it wouldn't have the impact of what I'm talking about this morning. He says this, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourself know that we are appointed for this. Right? And then he goes on, for in fact, we told you before when we were with you that you would suffer tribulations just as it has happened and you know. And then he goes on, he says, for this reason, when I can no longer endure it, I send to know your faith, lest by some means the temper, tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. And uh, it goes on, and I'd like to just read some. He said, by, by now uh, that Timothy has come to us from you and brought the good news of your faith and love, and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us, and we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all of our afflictions and distresses, we are comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live and you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you? For all the joy which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. So it sounds like there's got to be this continuation. Uh, and mutually, we need to do that, right? Remember, he said strengthening and encouraging each other, right? Strengthening, how do we do that? How do we underpin someone else? Well, we come alongside one another, right? We fortify the faith of one another. We build each other up in the most holy faith. We have to do that. Otherwise, when the times of trouble come, we'll wane. We're, we're weak within ourselves. I'm not weak because of the, the power of God within me, but we need one another. Amen. You see? That's why it is important not to forsake the assemblies of the saints. As we come, we encourage and build one another up in the most holy faith. Faith comes by what? Hearing. Yeah. And the message of what? Who? Of Christ. So if you're not hearing uh, the message of Christ, you're not getting build, a build up in your faith. You're not being edified. You're not being encouraged. You're not finding the strength to go on another day if we're set aside. You see, the devil would love to have us isolate. You know? Matter of fact, an idle mind is a devil's workshop. That's why we need to be renewed in the mind. And, and how we don't, the scripture says this, don't, don't conform, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't conform to this world. It's very easy to conform to this world, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's very easy to have one foot in it. Because we want to just get along and sing from Bible. And it is. It's good. We want to be the salt. We want to be the preserver. We want the world to assimilate into the church, not the church to assimilate into the world. And that's what has been happening. You see? Um, am I right in some ways? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, here... Paul, he's writing to the church of Thessalonica, just, uh, you know, knowing that they were destined for these trials. And here I'm sending, I can't make it, but I'll sell, send Timothy, the minister, man of God, to come and encourage you. And by the way, uh, if you read on, you find that Timothy came back 
and brought a good word that the church was strong and stayed firm in the faith. And that's a blessing, isn't it? It's a blessing. Um, turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, we'll, we'll look in chapter 4. Um, because Peter writes this to those that were being persecuted and struggling. He said, don't think it's a strange thing that what's happening to you. Don't you ever feel that sometimes? That I'm the only one that this is happening to, you know? I got all the pressures of life. No. He says, don't think it's a strange thing he's persecuted for your brethren throughout the world are going through the same thing you are going through. Why? Because they trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I guess I'm, what I'm trying to uh, get across is this is not unusual 2,000 years ago. It's not unusual today. As a matter of fact, it may be even getting worse. Mm -hmm. We have certain things that are happening in our society today is called censorship, cancer culture, you know, all these things that, you know, they, they throw names at. That there's nothing new under the sun, but it's just another way to smother the name of the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to be unaware of the devil's schemes because when they come about, if we're not aware of them, we're going to think that something is coming upon us that shouldn't be coming upon us. But God told us you're going to face them. So be of good cheer. Know that they're coming. Be strong in the Lord and His mighty strength. Look what Peter wrote. 1 Peter 4, verse 12. He says, Beloved, do not think strange concerning the fiery trials of which to try you as though something strange thing was happening to you. Could you imagine that? These trials are coming, and you think, man, these are just some strange things. I'm the only one. I'm selected out of all the world, and uh, I'm the only one getting persecuted. No. The Bible told us before, and don't think that this is strange. Look what he goes on to say. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Hallelujah. So if you suffer reproach for the name of Christ, the spirit of God, it rests on you. So you endure, so you're able to overcome. You know? The Word of God is right and true. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. It does search the thoughts and the attitude of the heart. When we read the Word of the Lord, it is a mirror. If we're not in the Word of God, we are not getting nourished. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone. He lives by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We're not getting nourished. We're malnutrition. We're, we're going to be not strong, but weak. So where do we get our nourishment? It is not by pumping the weights, per se, but it is by taking in the word of God. There's where we find our strength. There's where we have our minds renewed. Then, prayer. Prayer is, an, is the vital lifeblood of the church. <clears throat> I had to apologize to uh, Pat the other day when we were, uh, I was talking with Kathy about having the service uh, this week. And uh, we were talking about Wednesday. I was not even thinking about our prayer time. And uh, when I discussed it with Pat, Pat said, we'll see if we can arrange it around the prayer time. And uh, how quickly we forget how vital it is for our prayer time. 
That is the lifeblood of the church. Some say, you know, the work of the church is feeding the poor and the hungry. No, the work of the church is the praying church. If you want to see the power in the church, we must have praying individuals. They, I once heard they say that if you want power in the pulpit, you must have prayer in the pew. Mm -hmm. And if we're not praying, you know, we, we can bring about some type of message, per se, uh, as Paul forewarned us, that in the latter times, he said this, he said, they're going to gather around them a great number of teachers to tell them what their engineers desire. But with only sound doctrine is what separates the joints and the marrow and the soul and the spirit and searches the thoughts and the attitude of our heart. The one who created us, the manual here is the one that knows us. Um, back to 1 Timothy, I hope you kept your finger in there for a minute. And chapter 4, you know they used to call this what, a sword drill? Isn't that what they called it? So I lost my place too. 1 <laughs> Timothy, look at chapter 4 and verse uh, one. This is amazing. And this is talking to the church, you know. This is not talking to the to the unbelieving heathen. Paul's writing to this church. He says here, now the Spirit expressly says that in later or latter times some will what? Depart from the faith. You see that? giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. We know that there's all types of religion out there that really are just doctrines of demons, you see. And they're almost parallel some to the, uh, our Christian faith. If we don't know the very word of God, we too will fall prey under what we hear. Why is it important? Yeah. So, what are these latter days? Do you think we're close to it? I'm not going to say that I know when the end time is. But it sure is focusing to a place of what the scriptures are telling us. For us to be forewarned, to be equipped, to be strengthened in the Lord, and then encourage each other to remain true to the faith. Do you remember the book of Jude? It's only one chapter, the third verse. Do you remember what it said? It said this in the book of Jude. You'll look it up. He says, I, I, I wrote to you concerning the common salvation, but I thought that I should write to you to contend for the faith that has been handed down once and for all from the saints. Contending for the faith is an important part of the Christian walk. Is it not? If we, we walk by what? Faith, right? And so we want to have a solid ground, where we have a good footing in our faith. Well, know what we believe. You know, the, the scripture says this, we, we need to answer those who ask you for the reason, for the hope that you might have. Right? Always be ready. Uh, be prepared. If someone says to you, what, why do you have hope like that? Why, why do you have faith like that? We want to be ready and prepared for that. We want to have faith in the Lord our God. Matter of fact, uh, the scripture says this, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without. Because those who come to him must believe that he exists. You must, we must know him. And it, it's, we are saved by grace through faith. Right? We're saved by grace through faith. Now, why is it important that we're built up in the most holy faith? So that we're strong in that. So that we can encourage someone else. 
so that we can spur someone on in the faith. Now, I'm not saying that each one here has to be a theologian. I'm not saying that you uh, need to know the scriptures back and forth. The more you know, the better it is, yes. But it is the Spirit of God that dwells in us when we yield to Him. He will bring to mind. Jesus told us this. He said, when I send the Holy Spirit, He will bring to mind everything that I have taught you. He will bring it to mind. You may not even know, but in that in particular place, when we're yielding to Him, He will bring up. Has, has it ever happened to you? Like, you know, like, wow, I don't even know where that scripture came from. That's because God has given you, whether it was for your defense or offense, you know, the Word of God is called the sword of the Spirit. And the shield of faith is risen. So sometimes we take the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith. You remember the whole arm of God, right? You know, as you start tearing that apart and you start looking at why, you know, uh, the helmet of salvation, guard the heart and mind of Christ, right? Uh, the breastplate of righteousness, you know. Uh, we do what is right because we guard the heart for it is the wellspring of life or all the issues of life come out of the heart. Do you know that? Do you know that as water reflects a man's face, the heart reflects the whole man? Right? That's who we are, is in here. You see? And God wants us to guard that and protect that. You know? And of course, you know, the former belt of truth, feet fitted, fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And then we take up the shield of faith to extinguish. Do you remember what he says in there? Extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Do you think that he's trying to? Sh what are some of the flaming arrows? Uh, he tries to shoot doubt and fear and worry, concerns. All those things are are arrows from the evil one to tear us down and to ignite us for his passions. You see, but we have been saved by grace for the passion of the Lord to be used by Him. And so we, we raise the shield of faith and we hold it out and, and we remember that God will do what He says He will do. I am who God says that I am. Uh, His Word will work in my life uh, as it's determined here. Um, we are more than conquerors through Christ who has given us strength. And fifthly, we are common faith together. You know, we ran over uh, in our time, and I don't want to, but i like to just look at um, Hebrews chapter 3 for a minute, please. And then we'll, we'll close with this. What I found in the last few weeks was that taking the very sermon from the scripture, you can't go wrong. Because it is God speaking to us. And look what we find in the book of Hebrews. Uh, Pat mentioned earlier uh, about the book, The Betterment of the Lord Jesus Christ in, in all things. But look what he says here in verse 12 through 14. Chapter 3. Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Did you see that? We become not saved, but walking in that kingdom that we started with. We must go through many hardships to enter in or walk in 
the kingdom of God. It's not saying, if you look at that, it's not saying that um, this is earning your salvation. The birthmark, going back to that description of a believer, is not one that uh, who overcomes or endures. The birthmark of a believer is that they are saved so that they can overcome and endure. So, you know, in Matthew 24, again, if you read the one scripture, it says, those who endure unto the end shall be saved. And you ever see that scripture? And you may think, well, man, I must hold on and I must endure if I'm going to be saved. No, we all know that we're saved by our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. By the blood on Calvary. This is not of ourselves, they say, any man shall boast. But because we are saved, we shall endure even the hardships that are going to confront us. Beloved, believe the word of God that you will face them. So that gives you greater endurance to know the hope that God will bring you through. He's already told you beforehand, you're going to face them. So when they come, I know that. God has told me that. Sometimes they sideswipe us. Sometimes they jar us. Sometimes we may sound like those in 1 Peter, like uh, something strange has happened to us and we're uniquely getting persecuted or uniquely getting pinpointed on one. But remember, it's an encouraging word that God had forewarned us, not so that He would scare us, but so that He would strengthen us. To know you're going to get through, beloved. Because listen to this verse we find in Philippians. The good work, it's verse 6, if you want. The good work that he begun in us, in Christ Jesus, he will bring on to completion. That is such hope. Father, we close. And I thank you, Lord. Thank you for the congregation here, Lord, as, uh, as we continue to encourage each other and link arms with each other, Lord. And, um, we know, Father, that this message in the world, Father, is uh, um, not very tasteful to many. And so, God, I pray that as we stand firm, uh, that we might encourage others. Uh, Father, our, our loved ones, our, our family members, our neighbors, Lord, uh, we love them so. And, Father, we know you love them greater than we do. And, and yet, Lord, help us to stay the course, Lord. Help us not to shipwreck. Um, Lord, uh, help us to stand firm, Father, unto the end. And uh, I thank you for that. Uphold each one here. Strengthen them by your power. Uh, guard their hearts and minds in Christ, Lord. Uh, let them know, Father, that you are with them. And I'll thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.